This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. Please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu for more information. Consumers tend to associate Johnson & Johnson with Band-Aids and baby shampoo. But those well-known products are only part of a much larger picture, according to William Weldon, chairman and CEO of the New Brunswick, New Jersey-based firm. In fact, Weldon has the mind-boggling task of overseeing more than 200 operating companies across three sectors, including consumer products, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices. On June 18th, Weldon spoke at the 2008 Wharton Leadership Conference about the challenges of running the Johnson & Johnson family of companies. In an interview with Knowledge at Wharton, he elaborated on how J&J's decentralized structure informs his leadership style and what he sees as key issues for the healthcare industry in the coming decade, among other topics. Mr. Weldon, thanks for joining us today. It's great to be here. Many of our readers are familiar with Johnson & Johnson consumer products, but they may not be familiar with uh, the Johnson & Johnson family of companies and what that actually encompasses. Can you give us an overview? The way way we look at our organization is really that we have three business segments we work in. One is the uh, uh, consumer business, which you alluded to, which is a lot of the baby products, Uh, baby shampoo, baby powder, um, band-aids, but then it also includes Neutrogena and Aveeno and and many of the uh, other, uh, a lot of consumer companies that people would not know belong to the J&J family. The second part of our business is our medical device and and diagnostics business, which by itself is the largest medical device and diagnostics business in the world. And that consists of everything from cardiovascular products for stents to joint replacements for knees and hips to lenses with AccuView and um, blood glucose meters, uh, surgical uh, uh, Ethicon sutures and endoscopic instruments. So it covers a broad array of, of products. And then we have our pharmaceutical business, which is our largest segment. It's over 40% of our business. And that really deals with cardiovascular products, uh, oncology products, uh, immune mediated for rheumatoid arthritis and, and uh, those types of areas. So a lot in the virology area for HIV AIDS and tuberculosis. So when you, when you look at J&J, most people think of it as the consumer side, but um, it's actually our smallest portion of the business. And um, it's about, uh, we have about $61 billion in revenue and anywhere from 180 to 200 billion in market cap. What are the main challenges of leading in a decentralized corporate environment, including across countries and cultures? You know, it's it's interesting. I, I think there's pluses and minuses to decentralized and centralized. I think J&J is probably the reference company for being decentralized. You know, there are challenges to it, and that is that you don't have as much control as you may in a centralized company. But the, the good part of it is that you have wonderful leaders, you have great people that you have a lot of confidence and faith in, and they run the businesses. So if you look at it, that uh, if you take Japan, for example, we have local management running the companies. They understand the consumer, they understand the people they're dealing with, and they understand the government and the needs in the marketplace. Whereas it's very hard to run it from the U.S. and, and think that we, we would know enough to be able to do this. So I, I think I think it really affords us a lot of opportunities by being decentralized. What you do lose is control. But with our credo and with the, the value system that we work under, we feel very, very confident about our leadership and our management, and you have to have trust and confidence in them. I think the other thing that decentralization does is it gives you a tremendous opportunity to develop people. So you get them a lot of opportunity to work in different areas, to work in smaller companies, to make mistakes and work in, and ultimately move into larger companies. I also think the benefit of the cultural side that you asked about is that you do have local people running the businesses. So the men and women that run our businesses around the world usually are are people that grew up in those markets, understand those markets, and develop themselves in those markets so they can relate to the needs of the of the customer, whoever that customer may be. So, so the challenge really, I, you know, I see it a great uh, a great benefit rather than a challenge because. The problem with centralization is if one person makes one mistake, it can cripple the whole organization. This way, you've got wonderful people running businesses. Uh, You have to have confidence in them, but you let them run it, and you don't have to worry about uh, making that one big mistake. When you became CEO in 2002, what was the biggest challenge you faced, and how did you overcome it? Um, you know, I think the challenges always are, it's, it's around the area of people and making sure you have the, enough really outstanding leaders to run the businesses. We just talked about decentralization and, and, uh, and, and 
allowing people to run the business. We have over 200 operating companies. We need 200 great leaders. I think the challenge is always developing the great leaders that can run the businesses. I think that's always the biggest challenge. I think the thing that that really is the challenge for anybody who goes into a role like I went into is worrying about who's going to sit here next. I mean, it's a responsibility where you have, you know, you can think about shareholders, but you think about the 120,000 plus employees and families that we're responsible to. And you want to make sure when, when you leave that you're leaving it in hands of people that you feel are, you're very comfortable with. You could go on and talk about we had, <clears throat> we had challenges in our pharmaceutical pipeline and we had to really revamp and do a lot of things in, in our R&D organization to make sure that we strengthened our pipeline. Um, because it really is, when you think about it, it's dependent upon people and pipeline. So you, you look at pipeline of people and pipeline of products, and those are the two things that I think we have to be focused on all the time. Your field, like many, requires a heavy focus on innovation in order to stay ahead. How does Johnson & Johnson's uh, decentralized corporate structure um, relate to innovation? How does it enhance it? Well, I think, I think what decentraliza where decentralization helps in innovation is that it allows different people with different, you know, different skills, different thoughts, and bring together different products and technologies to satisfy unmet you know, needs of, of patients or, or customers. So for example, if you look at, um, <clears throat> we had a meeting where we brought together our engineers from our MD&D group and our scientists from our pharmaceutical businesses. And they came up with putting a drug on a stent and, and developed the drug eluting stent for cardiovascular disease, which was a huge breakthrough. And it, it actually brought the skills and knowledge from two different sets of people together. We're now working on a product that we just launched in Europe and will launch here shortly, which did the same thing. It brought the skills of the engineers together with the skills of the scientists to, to develop a basically a patch which will deliver a narcotic for post-operative use so the patients don't have to carry around the PCA pumps and everything else with them all the time. They just touch it. It's about the size of a credit card. You hit it and you get your dose of narcotic and it has a battery which makes sure it's delivered properly in the right amount, the right time, right frequency. Um, so, so you look at the convergence of these skills and technologies and products <clears throat> and then people and I think it offers us a distinct competitive advantage. If you fast forward into the future, I think you're going to see a lot more personalized medicine. So we're going to look at biomarkers and uh, genomics and genetics and, and we're going to be able to identify who will respond to a product, who won't respond, who will get a side effect, who won't get a side effect. And that takes the skills of our diagnostics group and our pharmaceutical group and putting them together to identify the patient that will, will respond to these products. So I think that the decentralization and having these, this broad array of companies actually um, fosters innovation and stimulates each other who are working in similar areas. And what are the downsides to that structure? Uh, with so many subsidiaries, I imagine that coordination must become quite an issue. I think, yeah, I, I think you hit upon it. I think the downside to decentralization or, or in, in this area of innovation is actually the coordination. Um, it's trying to get people, you know, together moving in the same direction. One of, one of the real challenges is that, as I said before, we have our pharmaceutical group, our medical device and diagnostics, and our consumer group. Well, they each have their responsibilities in, their, in the markets they compete in. So when we try and bring people together across the different groups, sometimes you know, there's, there's enough to do in their own group that now we're asking them to cross boundaries and work together. And sometimes we'll set up skunk work groups where we'll send them off on their own. We call that our internal ventures where we'll, we'll do those things. Um, but but that, is, that is the challenge is the coordination. Not so much there's, that there's replication, but finding the right people to be able to give the resources to this convergence of technologies as opposed to just working in their own areas. If you, if you look at straight innovation as you would in any pharmaceutical group or medical device or consumer group, we have all those working in our R&D organizations in each of those. It's the ability to work across the boundaries that really brings true innovation, I think, and, and is going to take some real breakthroughs and bring real breakthroughs in the future. But it also does take some coordination and some, some sacrifice from the individuals. So that, that is the toughest thing is getting people to get outside of the silos that they work in and work across the groups. Can you identify uh, the formal and informal ways that Johnson & Johnson identifies new innovations? Yeah, we have, we have a few things. One, one thing is we have what we call internal ventures. 
and the internal ventures would be uh, somebody working in the organization or a group of people who may put forward a recommendation of something that could be done. We're, we're doing a lot of work in stem cells, for example, where none of the groups will take ownership with it, but there's a great opportunity there. So they put together a business plan, present it, put together a budget with it, and then we allow that group to go off and work on that. We, we create other environments, for example, if we're, we're looking at the area of oncology where we may bring people from the consumer pharmaceutical and medical device and diagnostics groups together to share what they're doing. And out of that will, you know, basically they will generate ideas where they can work together to, to bring products forward. And it's usually better when they generate them than when we try and impose upon them. We did do a, a review of our pipeline um, probably about a year ago. And we found that there were 80 products in our pipeline that had some form of convergence that was necessary. Now the important thing for us to do is to make sure that we understand the value that those bring and maybe of the 80 of them we ought to work on half a dozen of them. And it's being able to, to bring those down into a, a focused area. We have another, <clears throat> another product going on in our medical device group, in our Ethicon group, which is primarily in the suture and wound closure area that is um, needing the skill sets of the people in our biotechnology area. And it's um, actually a, a product to stop bleeding, serious bleeding, but it has to have a bio base on it. So we brought actually scientists from the biotechnology area over to work specifically in the Ethicon group to work in that area. So it's, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of both formal and informal ways that we could create this environment. And probably the last thing we do, which has been very successful, is we've created an, our own internet for our scientists so they can go on and see what others are doing, communicate with each other so that if there's an interest in one area, they can get people getting together, thinking about those areas and working together to, to bring products to the market. What are the major challenges facing drug and healthcare companies, both in the U.S. and abroad? Yeah, I, I think probably the single you know, if it's not the single largest, but if you look at the cost of health care, um, you know, I think it's, it's a responsibility we all have to figure out how do we get it better under, really under control. Um, and it's driven by demographics, it's driven by, you know, the aging population, the emerging middle class in other parts of the world, and technology. And people want to live longer, they want to live better, they want to live healthier. So I think we have, we have a couple responsibilities. One is to get up front and look at prevention and wellness and healthy people and how do you keep them healthy and then treat them on the other end where they need the treatment. So I think the cost of health care is a big challenge. I think the regulatory environment has become another huge challenge. I think that um, people are looking for products that can be risk-free and they're, you know, you get up on a morning and you walk across the street, that's not risk-free. So don't think that you're going to be able to deliver a product in a patient. Drugs, by definition, have good effects and side effects. I've had a knee replaced, and, you know, there's a risk associated with having your knee replaced. Mine's worked out extremely well, but it could have also gone another way. You can, there's all kinds of, of issues there, and I think that the, everybody's looking for this risk-free environment. And it's not risk-free. Uh, there are risks associated with it. I think we have to define them. We have to do good research. We have to look at evidence-based medicine and see what's, what's going to come out of it. But I think the regulatory environments have become somewhat um, uh, risk-averse, if you will, and trying to find out everything. And until you get out into, usually into patients, many times you don't find everything out because of the way somebody may use a product or whatnot. So, so I think it is in the area of cost control, I think it is in the area of regulatory, are probably the two biggest, no matter where you look in the world, um, barriers that we have to overcome. And it puts the onus on, I think, the industry, um, and this isn't all bad, it puts the onus on us to do better work when we do our clinical trials, when we do our research, when we, when we, we have full transparency and disclosure. I think that's, that's really important. Um, and I think it comes to the ability of the regulatory bodies and industry to work together. And we've been advocates of strengthening the regulatory bodies because the stronger they are in science, the stronger it'll force us to be and the better it'll be for patients. Um, and, then, and then the cost side, we just have to be willing to step up and make sure that we are. And I think the industry does support indigent people. Um, you know, we've, we've done... We've, we've actually supported in sub-Saharan Africa our HIV products we've made available there at, at very low 
prices if there are indigent patients here in the United States they just have to file a form with ourselves or any other pharmaceutical company and we'll supply them products free of charge if they qualify which is you know a very low level to qualify so I think we're doing all we can but I think we have to continue to do more Johnson & Johnson has operated in India for more than 50 years now and recently there was a big shakeup among drug companies there when a Japanese firm Daiichi Sankyo bought out Rambaxi what is, your, what is your view on that deal, and does it say anything about the state of the pharmaceutical industry in India? Well, I think 70, you know, I, I could be wrong on this, but I think about 70% of drugs dispensed are generics here in the United States today. Um, there's a big opportunity in the generic field because of large products going off patent. Um, but I think if you are a research-based company, um, you need to really commit yourself to research. Um, if you're a company committed to your employees, you need to make sure they're treated appropriately and, and properly, and, and there's costs associated with that. So I think what, what it really comes down to that there, there is a need for generic companies, good generic companies. Um, a model that some you know, companies may want to choose is to go both generic and ethical pharmaceuticals, let's call them, or, 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 or research-based drugs. Um, so it's each each company has their own choices that they have to make. Personally, I think that if you have good research, you understand the needs of patients, and you can deliver good products into the market, that's the most important thing to be doing, and that's where where we've committed ourselves so far. But um, that's not to say that that we wouldn't go into to generics or other companies. And and I don't think, you know, I think that there's a big market emerging, big opportunities in the future, and I think it's uh, each company has their own business model that they think is the the best for them and some may be to both be a research-based and a, and a generic company, others just research-based and others just generic-based. So I think it's, a, it's an individual choice, but I think as, you, as, as the generic industry has evolved, it's evolved into very good products um, and that many reputable companies are going there and feeling that that's part of the model that they want to choose. So I think it's just really personal choice for the company. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thank you. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.